Fomorians are the most hideous and the most evil of all the giants in D&D. They're more foul than even trolls, and that's saying a lot. They began as essentially giant elves. They were very magical, very beautiful creatures, giants of the Feywild. But they fell, and they fell unto essentially giant hags, this horrific, twisted, vile thing, again, still associated with a fey type lineage. Interestingly, I noticed that the Anis Hag even looks like a Fomorian in many ways. So let's take a deep delve into the Fomorian and see not only its lore, but also what it represents. I think there's a lot that's symbolized in this monster, and it stood the test of time. This is actually a creature that's been around since the first edition era of Dungeons and Dragons. So that's something to pay attention to. Whenever something has been around for a long time and stood the test of time and been filtered through and had a staying power, you know there's something going on. There's some kind of truth something powerful that it's expressing. Okay, so the history of the Fomorian. Well, they are giants or giant kin, you might say, and they originally are native of the Feywild or dwelling in the Plain of Fairy, if you want to put it that way. And they're very beautiful. They're very handsome, extremely majestic and extremely gifted magically with arcane magic. And some sources even say their magic was unrivaled, but they fell and they fell terribly. They were cursed, in fact. And this is a pretty epic level curse because this is a curse that applies to their entire race, asterisk on that, and they can't get rid of it. They can't free themselves from this curse. And this curse is what twisted them into this grotesque form that they have now. And it robbed them actually of many of their powers. So we can just see in the art that they're very deformed. They have this one eye that's bigger than the other eye. And the pupil of the eye looks like a cat, or I would even say like a snake. And their features can be, their facial features can be all to one side or kind of scrambled up. One arm might be bigger and they're bent and they are not in good shape, not at all. They're very disgusting and they have bulges and mounds of twisted flesh and tendons. And I think hideous is the appropriate word. They're not particularly bright. I mean, they used to be very intelligent, but they're not anymore. Um, they're not completely dumb. They're not like ogre level intelligence, but they're a little under what we would consider a normal human intelligence. They have crude ways now. They just use crude clubs and bludgeons and other such weapons. They kind of scavenge things. They're not really very good at smithing or crafting their own equipment. And an even worse problem than even the intelligence level is the fact that they're so chaotic, they're so evil, they're so disjointed. They betray each other, they backstab each other, they're characterized by disloyalty. They just cannot organize themselves. And that reminds me of trolls in a way, because trolls, they don't really have a society to speak of. Fomorians, maybe we would say they have a society in like just a small fragment, like a small ruined, twisted fragment, just a shadow of uh, what they used to have. They're so malformed, they can't even throw rocks like most giants do. So they just resort to barbarically bludgeoning their targets or maybe ambushing them. They can be somewhat stealthy. They are also highly perceptive, so that maybe gives them an edge. Something about the way that they're arranged physically now makes them good at detecting foes. That big evil eye that they have can place onto their foes a bit of their curse. They can kind of transfer that curse and the foe becomes transformed and can't really move itself properly. So like you would get disadvantage on your attack rolls and your ability checks and so forth if you get subjected to this evil eye curse. But it's not permanent. It is temporary. You can repeat the saving throw at the end of every long rest to potentially rid yourself of the curse. And the bulging evil eye also has a way to deal supernatural psychic damage to targets. There also are some other types of Fomorians that seek to reclaim their arcane power, but they can't really produce it themselves. They can't study and learn it like wizards. They don't have it really innately like a sorcerer does anymore. So they have to have a master or a patron. So that leads them, some of them, to becoming warlocks, probably with like an archfey patron 
or witches in the sense of like the evil witch archetype. So let's get a little bit into their history. Where did they come from? Why did they get cursed like this? So their origin really is an ill-gotten one. They are one of the four sons of the goddess Othea. She was a giant goddess. She was the wife of Anam, the Allfather. And Anam is essentially the king of the giant gods, right? He is the, the highest essence of the spirit of giant. Othea was his wife. Well, she betrayed Anam. She had romantic affairs, romantic entanglements with others, with other gods. In particular, she had one prolonged affair with the god Ulutil. And Ulutil isn't exactly the greatest god out there in D&D. He's a god of coldness, a god of Arctic and polar lands. And their adulterous relationship resulted in four giant kin races being born. The Fearbolg, the Fomorian, the Virbig, and the Vodkin. The Fomorians went to live in the Feywild, and initially they were the most handsome of all the giants. Their beauty was complemented by their abilities with arcane magic. And they had an affinity for elves, or perhaps we'd say Eladrin, this was in the Plain of Fairy. In many ways, the first Fomorians were like giant elves. But apparently the Fomorians' beauty was only skin deep, as according to the lore, they eventually became arrogant and obsessed with magical power. The evil giant god Karantor urged them to take over the Feywild. A quick sidebar, there is another claim out there. Some say that the Fomorians are actually not the offspring of this adulterous affair between Othea and Ulutil, but rather they are the descendants of that god Karantor, who is a giant god. He is a son of Anam, one of Anam's son, and a god of hatred and disfigurement. So in the Fomorians' conquest, they sought to dominate all other fey races and to harness or even steal their magical abilities. This was as terrible an idea as it sounds. Powerful fey forces, of course, fought back and banded together. And those Fomorians who survived the warring were cursed by their intended subjects such that they became the twisted vile things that we know them as now. These fallen fey giants fled into the fey dark, which is the underdark in the fey wild, though some of them found crossings over into the underdark of the material plane, so they're definitely present there as well. It's also worth noting that some of the Fomorians actually left the material plane before this whole catastrophe began. So long before this, they traveled to other planes and made other planes their home, and they stayed there, and they actually avoided the curse. So the Fomorians are a cursed race insofar as there are the cursed Fomorians on the material plane, Feywild and in the world, and then the uncursed ones, which we can refer to as the noble Fomorians. Now, they're not really that great either. They also have tendencies towards chaos and evil, but it seems that they've been able to stave off the worst of their tendencies and to not fall upon these sorts of terrible dooms, this horrible fate that the cursed Fomorians fell into. And according to the lore, these noble Fomorians do return every once in a while to revisit. They can actually cast the plane shift spell once per day, which is pretty incredible. But it seems on these visits, they don't actually do a whole lot. They're not incredibly active. They seem to just mainly observe things to maybe get updates on the way things are going in the world and the plane of fairy. And of course, to reflect upon the downfall of their people. So the noble Fomorians definitely are not angels, but they do make some wise choices. And to this day, Fomorians continue to dwell in the Feydark and in the Underdark, making crude dwellings in the caves and the mushroom forests. They adorn their lairs with body parts and paintings of blood from their victims or their foes. They even make grisly trophies by stitching together body parts of the foes that they defeat. So what do the Fomorians represent? Okay, why have they been around for so long? Why do they have this striking effect on us? So there's this common idea that power corrupts. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, power in and of itself is not bad. 
can be used for bad or it can be used for good. I could probably say the same thing about ambition and aggression, and we can associate those things with the Fomorians. They were exceedingly ambitious and aggressive, and they channeled it in a bad way. They tried to dominate and enslave the Feywild. They tried to kill all those who stood in their way. But ambition and aggression can be harnessed for productivity. That energy can be channeled for constructive means. Power is simply the ability to affect a change. So you can affect change for the good. You can harness your energy and get into action and do something that is going to be of benefit, a benefit to yourself and to other people and to the world and so forth. Maybe a better way to put it is that power reveals. It reveals who someone actually is inside and it amplifies that. It amplifies their true self on this broader, bigger scale. And there's this association with magic and the Fomorians. Well, magic is power. That's what magic represents, especially arcane magic. It represents that power, that controlling of the natural world, of the cosmos, of oneself, of other people. So we have these two origin stories of the Fomorians. They're either born of this adulterous relationship between the goddess Othea and the god Ulutil, or they are the descendants of an evil god of hatred and disfigurement. So if we take a step back and we look at the Fomorian's personality and think, what does the Fomorian personality represent? What is it saying? I see some things. One is it's saying things are insufficient. Like their first origin story is saying, my marriage is insufficient. And then the second origin story is saying the order of things, the divine law of things is insufficient. You know, I'm not getting what I deserve. I'm not getting the good life that I should be due. I'm getting the short end of the stick. Then through pride, that connects to and these insufficiencies that I'm suffering from, or I'm a victim of, they're not my fault. It surely has nothing to do with my own shortcomings. It's not that my behavior is lacking. It's not that I'm not living up to my potential or I'm not doing the best work that I could be doing. No, it's not that. The problem is with the world. The problem is with the divine order of things. And then if we think about their, their divine parentage, and remember that gods in this sense, like in mythic storytelling and fantasy and mythology, a god is always a representation of some type of personality or some you know human element or maybe a natural force. So the god is like this distillation, like the very essence of the spirit of that type of personality or of that force given form, right? Like a larger than life character made out of that force or that personality type. So we've got these two potential deity parents. There's Othea or there's Corondor. And Othea, you know, she represents the corrupted feminine, you know, the, the wife that has gone down the wrong path, the betraying spouse, the woman who destroys her own household. She betrays her husband, Anam, the Allfather, the chief of all the giant gods, and he rebukes her, he separates from her, and ultimately Othea is betrayed by her own son. She is killed, poisoned by her own son. How tragically ironic is that? Or the Fomorians were fathered by Korontor, a god who represents hatred and ugliness and deformity. So they come from a bad seed either way. Whichever lore we go with, and you could even go with both of them for that matter, they're doomed from the start. From one perspective, they're born of the spirit of betrayal, which they go on to attempt themselves when they try to conquer and enslave and betray all the Feywild that they're a part of. Or from the other perspective, they're born of the spirit of malevolent anger and deformation. They wield their anger or their energy inappropriately, and they end up horribly deformed as a consequence. And any sympathy that we might feel for the Fomorians, it only will last for like five seconds. For one, they're just so 
awful. You can't really sympathize or have much uh, compassion for the tragedy of someone when they're so terrible and they really brought that tragedy on themselves, which really is characteristic of tragedy, like in the classical dramatic sense. The, the, the deep tragedies always are self-inflicted tragedies. And not only are they so awful, we also get this contrast because we can see the noble Fomorians who chose a different path and did not get cursed. Again, the noble Fomorians, they're not saints, but they do show us that you can make choices and the choices that you make, the decisions you make, have consequences that ripple out for <laughs> I mean, as far as we can tell, all of time. The Fomorian has continued on in the same vein since the early days of D&D. And that's where it really comes down to. That power, that aggressive action, the ambition can be put on a good trajectory or a bad trajectory, depending upon the choices that are made, the way that it's approached, the intentions behind it. The cursed Fomorians refused to accept that they had to do something better. They had to be better. They had to do better work. They had potential that they were not achieving. They went down a wicked path instead, and they chose to try to conquer all, to reshape the world according to their will, the way that they see fit, according to the spirit of malevolent anger. So this monster has stood the test of time for a reason. It has a powerful truth conveyed through it, and it's a harsh truth. If you wield power in an evil way, people are likely to fight back against you, to band against you, to exile you, to curse you. If you let that evil seed grow inside of you, you're going to become something else. It's going to take over you, and you're going to become a twisted mockery of what you once were. You're going to grow into arrogance and a kind of loathing for the order of things. And that is going to make you a hideous, grotesque, cave dwelling, shunned, deformed thing. Even if you come from very bad parents, that does not give you the right to do wrong, to lash out because of the unfairness of life or the supposed insufficiencies of the world. Instead, you can have a bit of humility and you can also channel that anger as productive energy to work on yourself, to improve yourself, to improve your behavior and the quality of your work. The truth is things aren't always fair. Sometimes the dice just give you a natural one. So you can get really bitter and mad about that and lash out and that's going to make everything worse and everybody else who's at the table that's going to worsen their experience and people aren't going to want to play with you or you can take it in stride you know take it with a little bit of grace or a little bit of humility or at the very least just kind of a baseline maturity then your focus can be instead not on being bitter about the unfairness but what can you do better? You know, maybe get a better plan or try to focus on the things you can control the next time your turn comes up. So that's the Fomorian. He thought he was the best, the most beautiful, the most magical, the most powerful one around, but inside had a festering seed of corruption. And he kept going with that. He followed a spirit of hatred that led him to a terrible downfall. And to make things worse, the Fomorian continued in that same trajectory. He doubled down with his pride and resentfulness and revenge, staring accusingly with his inflated ego eye at everyone else instead of looking inward and self-reflecting on all of the hideous ways in which he did wrong. I wanna say a quick thank you to everybody who supports me over on Patreon, especially these fine fellows that compose the Patron Council. And if you yourself have not yet taken a look, check out the link down in the video description. There are different tiers. There are free things every single month as well. I put out a bunch of content to help enhance your adventures and your campaigns and your games. I wish you balance, my brave companions. I hope you can walk that line between confident action and humility and the self-reflection that is needed to continue to improve. So may you continue to grow and to improve. And as always, may your adventures be many.